this one character has like horrible things happen over and over again. And his wife says, you know, I don't know how you do it. All these things have happened to you and you harbor no resentment. How do you do it? And he said, it's so much harder to hold resentment, to forgive, you only have to do it once. Welcome to the Spiritually Hungry. I'm so hungry. <laughs> and I, podcast. I'm can, starving, I, can, I share with, can I share with our listeners that no, you both... No, because I'm going to sound like this is not something I want to hear. No, you are extremely tired and extremely hungry. Also. Nevertheless, we... <laughs> I'm we, a little delirious. We, <laughs> we are so uh, committed to sharing uh, wisdom and light with our listeners that you push yourself. You had a very busy week. I still do. Yes. This is not over so, till kudos to Monica. Sunday night. And I'm sure that our listeners will appreciate you pushing yourself. But you're you're talking like really softly. It's making know, me even more scream. tired. <laughs> you need to like know, tired, get some know. energy going, honestly. Oh, I can talk really loud. Do that. I don't want to blow out our uh, listeners' ears. Lately, are you tired too? <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm very energized. Because you actually seem more sleepy than I am. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not tired. All right, I know you love my stories, so I'm going to tell you one. I love stories. Um, so today we're going to talk about our greatness and what it takes to achieve greatness and what we can also learn from rejection. Spoiler alert. Rejection. That's a big topic. Spoiler alert. You should just ignore it. Rejection, not me. Oh, rejection. Oh, okay. <laughs> so that's what Lucy did. Good old Lucy. Do you know who I'm talking about? I don't know who. Do I know? Is that, is that a figure? Do you know any Lucy? When I, I say Lucy, Lucy, who do you think about? A few Lucy's. Don't think too hard. You don't have any Lucy's in your personal. What are you talking about? What's one Lucy we actually know in our lives? <laughs> I don't want to say it on the podcast. We know a Lucy? Yes. <laughs> I'll tell you later. I'm so I'll write confuzzled. It down. Oh, actually, I'll, yeah, I'll tell you later. So this is a fake Lucy. No, it's actually not. Do we know Lucy? I love Lucy. <laughs> Do you know what I'm talking about? I love Lucy. I know Lucy, yes. That Lucy? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Lucille Ball? There you go. I don't think most of our listeners will know who Lucille Ball is. I don't know the Lucy you know, because I don't know any Lucys at <laughs> all. Do. I knew one Lucy a long time ago. You do know Lucy. She was married to one of my uncles, but that was, <laughs> that was like decades ago. You know a Lucy, but okay. Okay, I'll just have to wait. The anticipation so is just So Lucille intriguing. Ball. Yes. So I'm gonna give it's you... not often you get uh, references to Lucille Ball nowadays. <laughs> People know who Lucille really Ball. Really and our children. Really... Pro- I mean, Abigail I has no clue. You, you think the older I, kids know? I have no idea. Really? No, I think most of our listeners. I would like to think they're evolved enough. That it's they not about were... being evolved. Yeah, everybody knows I love... I mean, come on. Really? Have you, by the way, have you ever seen I Love Lucy? I mean, yeah, I used to watch that for like a hot minute I've never, I've never when seen I was a teenager. <laughs> really? I don't know As why, actually. I'm not really sure. I think it's like I, I would go to bed really late and that was what was playing. It was before like we uh-huh. had Apple TV. It was just like, okay, what's on? And it was like midnight or something. Yeah, I think so. All right. Good old Lucy. I'm sure every, you're right. I'm, I'm wrong. Sure Everybody seen knows. That, like her dancing on the grapes, like as a meme or something. And I'd be, we're going to ask the kids. Abigail would have no clue. That I agree with. I'm sure with. the rest of the kids will have no clue. Anyway, you're going to learn a lot about her. Oh, great. I'm so excited. Kids. So this whole, this whole episode maybe no, is... No, this opening, because I think it's actually... I think when you see all the facts about how she got to where she went, which apparently nobody knows in the younger generation, it's really quite inspiring. It's so inspiring. All right. So she was in over 50 B movies before her hit show, I Love Lucy, aired in 1951. Okay, it is a long time ago. <laughs> While in her teens, the drama school she attended at NYC seemed to be, well, which school was it anyways in New York City? She seemed to be going well until a new student showed up and eclipsed her. The new student was Betty Davis. Isn't that interesting? Do people know who Betty Davis is? <laughs> no, no, but Did I you know. not see like... Um, Nobody's listening to this. Well, I was, no, no, nobody. I would say a good 70% of the listeners will have no idea. Are you serious? Yes. Wait, I'm going to ask people in the room here. You know Lucille Ball. Yeah. Okay. And Jason? Ricky Ricardo. Exactly. You know, you're going to come off really, really, really I am, here. Compl- I, am compl- I am sure. I am completely She's open like to being completely icon. wrong. And Betty Davis? I am completely open to being completely wrong. You don't know Betty Davis? Okay. Well, Jason? Oh, my God. Not Betty Davis eyes. What's wrong with you people? Anyway, 
Well, look her up. Okay. Yes. She's, she's right a now? phenomenal actress. <laughs> I didn't know you were such a Betty Davis fan. Because there was one movie she was in. It was like a thriller called um, something about baby. I don't think I've ever my seen My sister or whatever. It was like, oh, she was like so cruel that no, it's such a good movie that she, um, and she was jealous of her sister who was a movie star. <laughs> And then she, there was a freak accident. And then later you find out and like, she did like really mean things to her. So that's fine. But it is. Anywho, you really, <laughs> I don't know what you're doing here. I'm tired and I will go down any path you take me. Okay? Oh, this will be interesting. Maybe this will you be will take, you want me to turn left? The ra- let's go down go all the rabbit holes. I will. D- exactly. And you're, d- yeah, I have <laughs> okay. zero. Yeah, this, is my, this, is my goal. this is my goal for this episode. I have Not a to lot give of, any wisdom. I have a lot of points. Just to go down rabbit holes. We'll You're leading the me there. You absolutely are leading. I actually, love, let's do that today. Let's, Just rabbit let's holes? Scratch. Yeah, can we do that? I'd be really entertained. I do what? <laughs> I don't know. We'll see where we end up. <laughs> you silly webbit. So I have like 20 points on Lucille Ball. And okay. I'd like to talk about it. <laughs> let's go. Are you ready? I'm ready. I think it's cool. Okay, so you don't know Betty Davis, you don't know Lucy Ball, but anyway, the school that she went to <laughs> then wrote to her mother saying she's wasting our time and her own. She was fired from her contract job at Columbia Pictures. She tried out for Scarlett O'Hara and Gone in the Wind. Please say you know Scarlett O'Hara. Okay. I, know. I don't know if all of our listeners will. Well, spoiler alert, if you haven't watched that film, epic film, she didn't get the part, obviously. <laughs> CBS picked up her radio comedy show, My Favorite Husband, but refused to cast Desi for the part of her husband. At 36, she was already an old actress. And on top of that, her marriage with Desi Arnaz was on the rocks. She wasn't happy. She rarely saw him because of his travel schedule. And on top of that, they were having a difficult time conceiving. Then she pitched a new show starring herself and her husband, Desi. Now imagine the 50s, right? This is not like people had all kinds of ideas about this kind of couple. They also started their own production company called Desi Lou Productions to produce and film it. So then, and this I think is really interesting. Maybe it's just me. <laughs> they pitched it to CBS for television, but it wasn't sold. They worried Desi was too Cuban, his accent too thick, and they thought that Lucille was too glamorous to play a housewife. NBC was mildly interested, but when CBS caught wind that NBC was looking at it, they came back to the table, accepted the show with Lucille and Desi as the leads. So when the first episode aired, she was 40. And I always kind of love this. Like, even when we talk about your father, right? He had a whole life before he was 40, right? He, he was more of a salesman and he didn't actually find his spiritual kind of direction and Kabbalah until he was in his 40s. And often people think like, if I haven't achieved whatever I think I should have by that age, I never will, or it's over, it's done with, et cetera. Uh, yeah, and actually, you, yeah, in his mid, to those, till his mid 40s. Right? right, so... I thought and that was, yeah. And by the way, even in Hollywood today, there's a stigma of actresses. But imagine in 1951, 40, like, what are you even thinking? So I Love Lucy almost didn't make it. The exec saw it and thought it was unfunny. And they couldn't find advertisers. So they offered 50% off to anybody who wanted to advertise. And on top of that, it wasn't getting many viewers. So the CBS execs agreed to give the show one more week. And the very next week, guess how many people tuned in? Well, you have no idea because you can't watch this. <clears throat> 10 million? Ew, yeah. Oh. How did you guess that? <laughs> Bravo, Michael. 10 million viewers. Really? By 1952, Are you impressed? it was the highest rated show on TV with one fifth of all Americans watching. And I thought this is cute. Department stores closed early on Monday nights when the show aired, known as Lucy Mondays. So I Love Lucy was the first show to air a pregnant woman and write the birth of their real life child, Desi Jr., who also played, I'm sure, Jason, who did he play? Little Ricky. <laughs> so why did I tell you the story? I'm, 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 <laughs> I'm asking myself the same question. <laughs> <laughs> because I think people would have thrown in the towel by 40 and accepted that it just wasn't meant to be. And I'm, I'm asking all of our listeners, how many people would have given up after the drama school even, right? Sent a letter to her mother saying, we've given up on her and she should too. This is never going to happen. So I'd say tip one, as we're starting this, on your journey to greatness is ignore rejection. Because rejection's big. I don't think it hits you like uh, the rest of the world, um, to be honest, for me because I met it, I found it a lot at different stages of my life. At first, it kind of defeated me. And then I decided that 
um, I can either give in to this or I can fight. And I used that rejection as a motivator to say, okay, I'm just going to show you, right? Maybe there's a little ego in that, but I think that was like the healthy side of ego. Um, but yeah, so I would say that's the first tip. Um, but yeah, now I invite you to take me down whatever rabbit hole you want to. Well, I, I'm very um, excited about this topic because I think... Have you ever felt rejection? I'm sure I have. But you don't even remember. That's the thing about you. I'm sure you've had a lot of the experiences that you're like, oh, I can't. It just doesn't stick. Yeah, you no, know, I have. No, I can think of. Yeah, okay, I can count, the, count those times. Really? Yeah. Um, but again, this is a little bit off topic. But I think it's important when we think about our lives and our purpose and our greatness that it's never outwardly based. Which means that. For me, the question always was, am I doing what I need to be doing? Am I doing it to the best? Sweet Baby Jane. That was the movie. Betty Davis, I'm sorry. <laughs> Whew, I was so worried. No, it's such a good so movie. Please watch it, everybody. It's black and white. <laughs> okay, what were you saying? Really? Should I watch it? Do you recommend you watch it? You would it? hate it because you don't oh, like okay. that genre, okay. but I, I loved it. and it's. I'll make a note not to watch I it. I actually watched it a few years ago again, and I was still intrigued. Okay. Um, Mildly. So for me, the question that I always ask myself up until this day, is, am I doing what my soul came into this world to do? And am I doing it well enough? Or how, more importantly, because the question always, the question, answer always is, yeah, you're on the right track, but can you do more? The answer always is yes. So, for me, it's not a, it's never been about, and I hope it never be, is about, how it's received, right? How people view me and or my work, but rather the internal question is, how can I push myself more to, to accomplish what my, soul, what my soul came into this world to accomplish? Because of that, I was never really that interested in what people thought, and therefore rejection from people outside of myself never really uh, stopped me or really took that much mind space, because that was never what I was going for. I was never going for, oh, I need to reveal my greatness so that you know, 10 people, 100 people, 1,000 people, 100,000 people think I'm a great person, right? But it's not just that, though. Like, if somebody is, if let's say you're hearing rejection uh, again and again, like, let's say, like Lucille Ball, right? So she wanted to be an actress. Lucille Ball? (laughs) (laughs) She had a goal, whatever. And again and again, people are saying no. Then at some point, you're thinking, even though I'm clear that this is what I want to do, and I have a desire to do it, and I think I'd be good at it, but if everybody, I mean, we've had those kind of challenges where we had a thought and everybody's around saying, you know, absolutely not. And we didn't listen to that. I guess it's more of like an internal knowing. I think think this is an important point that I think, like you said, I think it's true that a lot of people do get sidetracked or, or, or shut down by rejection. But even something again, I'm using acting as an example, which is which is kind of a, you do need people. You, you you won't be a successful actor if nobody thinks you're good, right? But the question is, what's the motivator? Nobody enjoys what you're offering, <laughs> right? The question is, what's the motivator? And I think even in those type of professions that are more outwardly focused, it's still in order for it to be great in order for the individual to manifest their greatness, it has to be driven by some internal desire. Whereas, I'm trying to remember, I think recently, I saw this um, interview by, uh, I think it was Marlon Brando, who I think, you know... You, Mar- oh, you, I know, you're um, the one who's failing well, at this whole... Uh, <laughs> and, and he this. was saying that, that this whole notion of being popular, right, is something he never bought into. And I think it's true. I mean, I don't know very much about him. I, Is that song know. playing in your head? Which one? Popular. No. I, I'm so all over the place. I don't want to <laughs> oh, <song> my heavens. <laughs> <laughs> What's that song? Um, it's in one of the kids' shows. All right. I want to be popular. <laughs> okay. Um, so it was never in his head. It was never in his head. And which is, again, you would think somebody who's... But that was, I think, that time, because you didn't have social media. You didn't have a lot of that. Like, you didn't but hear the... you still needed to be... Again, you need, you, one you would assume liked. you needed to be selling tickets to your movies, right? And and my, my point is that, that, and this is true, certainly, if somebody is pursuing an acting career, but it's hopefully for all of us, the thought that what is my internal driver? Why do I wake up and what do I do? And that should be coming from, I would call the soul. But what did he say? Term. He never was concerned with being popular, but what did he say no, was he did, his leading? Did he, he went on a whole 
tirade how 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 stupid it is that people spend so much time on being popular. Mm, and I like that. Yeah, and it's definitely true, right? But the point is that and this is true about greatness, and it's true as an, an antidote to rejection, you have to ask yourself the question, what is driving me? And the answer needs to be something internal. I feel that my soul needs to express itself in this way. I actually had a conversation with somebody some time ago about um, this person is a writer, and they were writing poems, and I, this was the, the exact point, you know, that that if your soul is telling you, you need to do this, then you need to do it. And it, yes, of course, we'd want, look, I write books, I want people to read them, but I don't write the books because I want people to like them. I write them because I feel my soul needs to express itself in that way. And this is what I was telling this, this, this writer, that, that your, if your soul needs to express itself in that way, forget about how it's accepted, liked, disliked, makes no difference. If your soul needs to express itself in this way, you have to express yourself in this way. And I think this is maybe the, the underlying idea for achieving greatness. Question, why? What is, what is my driver? And make sure, again, that it's something internal, that you're, you, you really have that time where you have that conversation with yourself, and you say, what do I need to do? What do I need to do? In what ways do I need to express myself in the, in the world? And then, and then it's much, if, if that's really your driver, it becomes much easier to accept rejection because you're not doing it for the people to like you or for people to accept even your work or your expression of yourself, but you're doing it because you must. Doing it because you must. Well, I think when we talk about greatness, um, I think it's important to kind of unpack that because it's not about thinking you're great and that you're great. It's revealing the it's it's revealing the the most um, profound parts of yourself that are rooted in soul, and it's about being in a state of flow. And I kind of want to just pause there for a second and unpack that because people at the highest level of performance, whether they're athletes or CEOs or special force operators, whatever it is, they describe a state of consciousness that that's called flow. A flow state is also known as being in the zone. It's the mental state in which a person performing some activity is fully immensed in a feeling of energized focus, full of involvement and enjoyment in the process of activity. And I would add, there's that spiritual component where you feel like there's no you. There's not a separation between you and what you're doing and what you're revealing. It's all one bundle of energy, one force. Um, it's a state of concentration in which action seems to be effortless. You feel alert, unselfconscious, and totally absorbed in the present moment. Flow is a state entered when you're performing at your peak or stretching beyond former limits, which I think is a big key. It's not this thing that we're talking about. Greatness is not going to be in the realm of comfort of what you know, um, of what you figured out. It's really removing yourself from any form of really physicality and and being in a state that's just full energy. Right. And I think... Because I think when we say greatness, people think, it's easy to think like, okay, greatness means this at the end of the day, right? You've achieved X, Y, and Z. And it's not something that even you would put on paper. It's more about what you're revealing of yourself. Absolutely. And, and, and I think this is a very important point. And to make it clear, being great does not mean being known as being, as great. being great. Exactly. Being great means expressing 100% of yourself, exactly. close to 100% of the time. And that might be, right, to use an example, a person who lives in the countryside and gardens all day, and, and they just feel that need, that desire to, to, to grow a field, a farm. And, and you don't even know what's going to happen with that field or that farm or who it's going to feed, right? You're just so in that state. Well, that you, that I, I think, again, you can only achieve an, a, the state of flow, which is important idea and experience if you're living at at, at an expression first as we said of like your of yourself of your soul and second that you're pushing yourself at 100 percent. so that so i think it's really important right because i think it can be confusing when you say greatness i think too exactly. often people th take that to mean how am i perceived am I your pe name perceived? is somewhere exactly it's stone not it's at all people know not at all and, and but 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 it is living in a state where 
close to 100% of the time, we are pushing ourselves to express our light, our soul, our purpose at 100% of our energy. Um, because you can have one without the other, and a person will not achieve greatness, which means a person might know, okay, my soul needs to express itself in this way. I need to write, for example. But if I'm lazy, and I only do that you know, three days a week at 30% of energy, I'm never going to achieve greatness. And also, if you're doing that because you're worried about the outcome and what people are going to think, again, you just get that, and that's how people really get stuck. Oh uh, yes, amongst amongst other ways, absolutely. So, so I think I really, I think this is such an important point. I just want to, you know, really underline it that that when we're talking, with true greatness is when you are living in in a, in a way that you're expressing close to a hundred percent of your energy close to 100% of the time, which often, like you said, will be, includes being uncomfortable, which means pushing yourself. You have to be pushing yourself, or else you cannot achieve greatness, but it will never and should never be about how it is perceived outside, how people see me. You know, there are many um, examples of this. You know, the, there is a concept that in every generation, there are 30, at least 36 people who are maybe the greatest souls of the generation. They are called the 36 hidden righteous. And nobody ever knows who they are. Usually, you don't know who they are. You never even heard about them. But they are responsible for the fact that the world keeps on moving. They are responsible for so much of the, the light and the blessing. So, so to keep the world kind of in balance. Absolutely. So, I really bring it back to the point that I really want our listeners to to get excited about becoming great. But but not greatness might be that you become one of these thirty six souls that nobody ever hears about, and that they actually go out of their way to conceal themselves. But they are actually some of the most important people living in the world, and, and that your is point all, in that. Well, what? And your point in that? The point is that it's not about. It's never about. Should never be about how it's perceived, how people view me. Nothing which, connected to ego. Well, yeah, because I think again, I think greatness for many people is how I'm going to. I'm going to be seen as a great person, and that's probably the opposite of greatness. That's probably the opposite of greatness. And to the point of ego, the reason why. We have to detach ourselves from how we're being perceived, is because spiritually, the ego is the greatest hindrance to greatness. Mm -hmm. It is the greatest hindrance to achieving a state of flow. It is the greatest hindrance to me being great. Well, isn't there one of my favorite quotes in the Zohar? Is he who is great is small. Exactly. Exactly. And it was one of my father's favorite sections. He that is great is small. He that is small is great. Meaning, a person who, in this world, you know, sort of has a huge ego. Really, in in real terms, they are a very small person. Conversely, a person who has very little ego is, and even if they are perceived as small in this world, in the true world, in the true sense, they they are great. And that's what we want to be driving towards, right? That's where we want to be inspiring our listeners to become great, but understanding that ego is is makes it impossible. And to the degree that we have ego, and more importantly, to the degree that we're not actively working on diminishing our ego, we are not going to be able to express the greatness of our soul as it's meant to be expressed, as it's meant to be revealed. So there's um, a book, a great book by George Mumford, and it's called Unlocked, Embrace Your Greatness, Find the Flow, Discover Success. It says that we're all in flow more than we even realize, and that we can train ourselves to be in flow for longer and with more frequency once we begin to recognize flow states. So some of those states look like this, being able to be present in the moment without fear, spontaneity, because right, we get so busy in our lives, like forget about spontaneity, right? We were spontaneous last night. I enjoyed that. A line between mind, body, and soul, operating at full potential, connected to our divine spark, intuitive, alert, but relaxed. And then Buddhists talk about the five hindrances to this kind of um, progress and greatness. And I thought they were interesting. One is we're hindered by sensual desires, meaning seeking pleasure through five senses, solely, mostly. 
Two is ill will, holding hostility, resentment, and bitterness. I mean, think about because this is the other thing. We can talk about all the things about how do you achieve greatness and you need to be in this positive state. But what about, let's look for a second at what pulls us back. Like primarily where are our thoughts and wherever our thoughts are, our actions are there to follow. And then that makes our character, right? I think, I think it's an important point, right? Because it's, it's, you have to understand that it's a zero sum game, right? That, that we have a finite amount of energy in any given day, in any given moment. And how much of your day was spent we, in this list? And if we it, allow the energy to leak, right, into ill will and anger towards other people, all those things, then I cannot be great today. It's just going to be impossible, because my 100% energy that was meant to be used for my greatness, for my soul revealing its greatness today, has now been 30% taken away. Leaked. It's leaking, and exactly. you don't even know you have a leak, right? Exactly. Well, and then, we, well, and no, and then at the end of the day, you will. feel like, oh my God, and, uh, and so where did all that energy go, right? So the second one, which I think is really a strong one for many, again, hostility, resentment, bitterness. The third, I, 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 let's, let's, I think it's so important. I really, really want to underline this for our listeners. Well, it reminds me of one of my favorite movies. Um, Tell me, uh, is it with Betty Davis? <laughs> <laughs> it's the, um, the lighthouse between the ocean, something like that. And this one character has like horrible things happen over and over again. And, his wife says, you know, I don't know how you do it. All these things have happened to you and you harbor no resentment. How do you do it? And he said, it's so much harder to hold resentment, to forgive, you only have to do it once. And that's just stuck with me because people live in that state, like their whole lives where they're angry at this one and that one owed them that. And how could this one do that? And, that? and then you wonder why your life is just not great, right? And that you are not great and you don't feel great. So, so, so what, what you're saying, and it's really important, is that even before we think about being great, manifesting and expressing our greatness on a daily basis, ask yourself, how am I depleting my energy that now cannot lead me towards greatness, right? And, and all these negative thoughts, right, hostility, anger, resentment, all that, literally, if you do that you know, 10% of the day, 20% of the day, that means today you will definitely not be 100% great. You might be 80% great, but but your soul will not be able to express its greatness today. You've, it's a you've, very, you've, very important point. It. Because I think we're, all, we're, not, we're not scared enough of the silly things that we allow our, our energy to, to be depleted by. Number three, apathy and laziness. So that's half-hearted action with little or no effort on the things that we really want, right? Because we can, by the way, we can talk a big talk. We can say, hey, I want to achieve that. I want to do that. And by the way, your brain doesn't know the difference between if you've actually done something or you're just speaking about it. It feels like it's already happened. So how much time do we replace talk for action? Right? Absolutely. You know, there's, it's a very, again, a, another very, very important idea that I really hope our listeners think about as, as we're speaking. Ravashlik has the example. He says, if you're trying to break a piece of wood, you could spend a thousand years tapping it lightly. The wood is not going to break. You need one sharp movement. I didn't break oh, the I table. I thought you right were going to do it. I was so no, excited. No, no, this is our spiritually My table. My muscular man. <laughs> <laughs> You're funny today. Um, oh, delirious. Delirious. Um, and, and that's the point. The point is, a person can ask, why am I not revealing my greatness? And I, I, I talk about this often because, unfortunately, I see this often. People who are motivated, people who have a desire, people who have a direction, but they're investing 60% effort, 70% effort, 80% effort. It's never going to... A person you, a person can live... Can you imagine how sad that is? A person who could have lived a great life in all ways, but because of laziness, and it doesn't always come out of laziness, but sort of the, the, the lack of impetus or, or push to invest... 100% effort, as cl at least close to 100% of the time, person, I don't want to say waste their lives, because good actions always, you know, are good to be, to have been done, but far from who they should have been. And a great way to kind of gauge where you're at is, where are most of your thoughts in a day? Is it, again, you know, thinking about the past and what should have been, or thinking about the future, what you want to happen, or thinking about that person that wronged you, or thinking about when you can just go home and just check out and watch TV or whatever it is, right? And there's time for, for most things, but where, where's most of your, where, where are your thoughts each day? 80% is where? 
90 percent is where and that's a leak of energy that does not allow for mm -hmm. for greatness so number four is anxiousness which is the inability to calm the mind right so it's not just about again there's levels and people have some real issues but for the most part it's like where are we in terms of finding tools ways a sense of purpose that we can actually take more control in calming ourselves and making sure that we trust the flow of life and that we're part of that frequency as well it's interesting related to that one of my i was actually sharing this this week with somebody there's a beautiful section in the czar that speaks about you know historically there's 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 souls that are were seen as great that from thousands of years ago moses aaron joseph and the Zora says, why were they great? And it says, because they achieved a level of certainty. Meaning that even though there were many things in every one of their lives that should have, would have caused great anxiety, they, one of their most important attributes was that they had strong certainty in what we call the Creator. But it means in, like you said, the flow of life, that, that the universe is conspiring for my benefit, and therefore I don't, I reduce at least the level of worry. And interestingly, it says, again, these were great people, and they, if you, if you or I were writing a biography about them, and we were writing the 10 reasons they were great, we can come up with a great list. The Zora says it all comes down to their level of certainty. Which was five, was doubt, because they're related, right? That The anxious and, and doubt, they're, they're close relatives, and it's the inability to have that trust in the process. Right. But everything is for your greatest good and, and the process is the purpose. And honestly, it's hard until it's not. If you really start choosing that that consciousness, that state, then that becomes the place in which you live. And then you're not so thrown by the ups and downs of lives. So you don't even see it as ups and downs. You just see it as, you know, like seasons, right? It's winter, it's fall, leaves fall, they grow. But it, it changes your whole kind of experience of life. I think it's a very important point. Again, you know, I, and I really like the leaking analogy that that when and again, understandably, we all go through times of fear, of doubt, of ang of, of anxiousness. But there are times where we allow ourselves to remain in that state. And to quote a great book, I don't know if you've heard of this one. Tell me, fear is not an option. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, by the way, for those listeners who don't know, I'm surprised if there are any listeners. Uh, it's Monica's great book. Sweetheart, if you I haven't still... bought it, no, no, wait, 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 uh -huh. not done. If you haven't read it, please stop the podcast right now and go to Amazon or wherever you buy your books and buy your copy and read your copy. My love, I'm still waiting Fears for you an option. Um, to read it cover to cover. <laughs> I have read it <laughs> cover to so. cover. I think you scanned. You scanned it. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Point being, <laughs> point being, point being, that one of the reasons why doubt and anxiety is not an option is because it literally depletes our energy. So on any given day, in any given moment, when we are meant to be great and can be great, when we allow doubt to linger, when we allow anxiety to linger to the degree that we can, we are literally sapping the energy. As we said, it's a zero-sum game. We give 20% of, of energy today to doubt. That's 20% of your greatness you will not be able to reveal. So one more, hopefully, reason why we, we do everything that we can to make fear and doubt not an option. And I think that uh, another great way to kind of navigate this and get on the other side is instead of thinking about, I'm going to put this energy out there if I'm sure I'm going to get the outcome that I want, right? I think so often we have goals, we have dreams, we have desires, but what if, you know, I, I very often just create, 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 and of course I have a goal and I have a desired outcome, but I'm so not there. When I'm just creating, it's just putting energy out there and I trust, because I trust the creator and I trust that the, the universe has my back and it's going to work out as it should, that that energy is going to go where it needs to go. And I think that honestly, if I had to define flow, that's really what flow is. I think it's a very important point. I love you keep saying it's so important. Right. It's so great. <laughs> <laughs> that one of the very, it might seem obvious, but I don't think it often is in my conversations with people. How do you manifest your greatness? Do. Do. And it doesn't mean that every action is going to be great or that every action is even going to be successful. But 
too often because we are thinking, planning, doubting, fearful, we don't do. And, you know, you know they, they say this about, about writing, right? When you write, just put it all, all out there. You always can and will edit later. And to our listeners... And also, by the way, the first book you write, you're probably going to read it 10 years later and be like, oh my almost God. Always, I mean, I, almost always. And then, but if you, if you stay stuck there... You've never written the second or, or the, the third, third or the fourth. Exactly. And, and to our listeners, the question has to be, what actions am I taking towards greatness? Not what great actions am I taking, because they might not be great actions, mm -hmm. but there have to be actions. And again, if you're taking 100 actions, it will lead you to greatness. If you take one action, expecting it to be the great action, it will never lead you to greatness. Mm -hmm. I think we're good. I have more, but I, so I think we should do a second episode. Okay, sure. On, so I think to our so listeners, I, I want to leave uh, sure. our listeners with a quote. But just before that, we are going to uh, next week continue this episode on greatness. I think it's a very important topic, and both Monica and myself still have a lot more that, that we'd like to share about it. Da -dum -dum. <laughs> so here's a quote. This has by, been a very unique episode. <laughs> I'm interested. I hope our listeners are know. enjoying it as much as I, I am. <laughs> this is a quote by Lori E. Smith from Soul Wisdom, A Guide to Miraculous Living. And she said, when it comes to assessing, I can't even say that word, when it comes to accessing intuitive information, it's not so much about the certain things we need to do, but rather it's about making space, getting out of the way so a higher power can connect with us. So a lot of this, again, that flow state, it's not about you know, what you're doing intentionally. It's, sometimes it's just about removing yourself and the intention just to create as we, as we said and then let the rest happen absolutely absolutely there's a, a phrase from the ancient sages that i really like it says uh, the work is not for you to complete mm. right but you are not allowed to refrain from work and the idea is that you we begin right we begin and then we we know that if we're doing the right thing with the right intention and we're acting and we're pushing ourselves at 100 percent, then the light of the creator will come and complete whatever it is that we're that we're meant to do so I'd like to share a letter from one of our listeners. This is from Haid. Hello, Monica and Michael. Hello. I'm listening to you from Sheffield, UK. I live in Mexico, but came here for a couple of weeks for a project. I listened to your podcast about spiritual parenting, and I found today's Monica's, Monica's words comforting and motivating. Quote, kindness is a form of spirituality. Mm. Remember saying that? No, I love okay. when I hear things. I said that sound good after. <laughs> I, I started like, yeah, studying said during COVID and I can feel my spiritual growth since then. I've been thinking about the best way to share this feeling with my 22 and 18 year old sons to interest them a little bit about spirituality. I think that kindness is a great way to start. I should probably start by being kind, in parentheses, or kinder to them, mm -hmm. behaving on a, in a more loving way and stop trying to control everything. Mm -hmm. I asked the Creator for the persistence to make this new behavior my normal. And while I get there, I will enjoy my process and, of course, want to keep on listening to you both and applying to my daily life what you share on this amazing podcast. Thank You don't know me in person, but you have been part of my weeks for a while. I love that. Thank you. Please keep doing this. Thank you. Thank you, Hate, for sharing this letter with us. It makes us happy and inspires us. To our listeners, please remember to continue to send your stories, comments, questions, topics to Monica and Michael at spirituallyhungry.life. Monica and Michael at spirituallyhungry.life. Your letters inspire us. In turn, those that we read inspire our listeners. So you have the opportunity for greatness by sharing your stories with us here. And as always, please make sure to go to Apple Podcasts, write five-star reviews, share this podcast with everybody you know. That's one more step, tool for achieving your greatness. And as always, and this was a special one for me, I hope you enjoyed listening to this podcast as much as I and Monica enjoyed recording it today. Stay spiritually hungry.